Welcome back, everyone. I recently did a buddy read on The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. Really good novel. Matthew uh, read it along with me. He's got his own booktube channel. And I've got a set of questions here uh, that are going to get us talking about this thing. So, Matthew, since you haven't been here before, why don't you give the viewers just a little bit of an idea concerning what you like to read and what you cover on your own YouTube channel? Yeah. Hey guys. Uh, so my name is Matthew and, uh, you know, honestly, we read all sorts of different stuff on my channel. So we have been diving into, you know, everything from historical fiction and memoirs. And um, we even just recently did a diet book. So we're kind of all over the place right now. And mostly we're just trying to, you know, kind of the idea on our channel is we are trying to just show you guys, you know, what is good in a book. Um, and, and, and we're focusing on just reviewing the book in a way that you can understand, is it a book that's written for you, as opposed to just giving your traditional one to five star review, um, which can sometimes be helpful and sometimes it isn't, because a one star review for me may be a five star review for John or for you or whatever. So instead we focus on who's the book really written for on our channel. That's interesting. Um, and I'll put the link, guys, for his channel down in the description for this video. I have a list of 11 questions here. So let's go ahead and jump right into this. The very first one here, and I'll try to field this one first, is what do you think the author's purpose was in writing this book? What ideas was she trying to get across? And Maybe the, the first thing that comes to mind would be the theme of perseverance. You know, there's a lot of oppression in this novel. It seemed like throughout this novel, something was going badly and then it would get worse and then it would get worse and then it would get worse. So perseverance, I think, was a primary theme as far as um, the author's purpose. I'm assuming it is to show perhaps the feminine side of what warfare can do to someone. You know, it was really interesting this one takes place in France and the people in France are oppressed. And that's something that can be easy to not realize. You know, when, when I think of the war, I think about uh, the beaches at Normandy and the death camps in Auschwitz. But there was a lot going on as far as influence goes that was outside of those things. So I'm assuming it was probably to show the feminine perspective on war and, and of course, to tell the story of the Nightingale, who was a real woman that inspired this book, a woman who had saved around 100 airmen during the, the war. I can't remember what her name was, but... Uh, that's what I've got for this one. What do you think? What do you think the author's purpose was in writing this book? Yeah, similar to you, you know, I really thought that a big part of it was telling, you know, kind of a female perspective on a traditionally, you know, male dominated kind of concept, which is war. Um, and, I, and I thought it was really interesting to see actually in so many ways, you know, war doesn't just affect the men who are fighting, but in some ways even more so affects the families who are back home. Um, and I feel like that was really, you know, a big part of this of this story was telling kind of that, that other side of the story that we don't get to see as often. Um, the other thing I thought that she did a really good job of was subverting your expectations about war. Cause everyone knows that there's, you know, um, it, I think she does this in a number of ways, but you know, she subverts our expectations right at the beginning uh, when we kind of find out, you know, is, is, um, the story she's telling from modern day or 1996 or whatever, you know, that that's different than what we're expecting when we kind of get into the novel further. And, you know, she's, she's kind of changing the way that we expect everything, including, um, you know, we'll get into this later about Beck, but, you know, the way that we think about Beck initially versus, you know, as we move through the way that we kind of change our mind about maybe German, German soldiers or Nazis, you know, you might have something at the beginning of the story that's, I've got a very clear idea about what a Nazi is. And by the end of the story, you might have a little bit different idea. So I think it really subverts a lot of expectations in that way. That is true. I think one of the things that she does is <clears throat> she actually kind of shows the potential difference between, uh, you know, the everyday German warfighter that's on the front line and an SS personnel. Uh, she has to deal with both Beck, who was a soldier in the war, and um, and von Richter, who was uh, was an SS. And there was quite a quite a difference there between those two personalities. Um, I, I just want to mention this here uh, right off the bat. Are you familiar with this book? Number of the Stars by Lois Yeah, it's a, it's a classic, isn't it? It is. And I just read it for the first time, probably about six months ago. I actually did a buddy read on here. And a woman that had her own channel came on and talked with me about it. It's a Newberry award-winning book. 
And it's an incredible story. And I, the Nightingale almost has to be at least in some part inspired by this story. You know, in the Nightingale, we have the French resistance. And in this one, we have the Danish resistance. And there was a very similar operation going on in Number of the Stars where a group of people were putting themselves at risk to funnel uh, people out of the country and get them to safety and everything. And there were sisters involved in Number of the Stars. So it's a very, very similar tale. Uh, and I just want to recommend that to anyone that liked The Nightingale. And you probably did if you're watching this. Uh, if you like either Number of the Stars or The Nightingale, you'd very likely, I think, like the other one. So I just want to get that out of the way. Yeah, definitely. That's an excellent book and, and wholeheartedly support your recommendation of, of Number of the Stars. It's an excellent, an excellent read. You know, the Newbery Award is an indicator that a book is a good book. You know, they don't just hand those things out. It's a very prestigious literary award. Uh, and I think that it was totally deserving uh, of that award. That's actually probably the last historical fiction book I read uh, before I read The Nightingale. But let's move on to the second question here. You can take this one. Did the character seem believable to you? Yeah. Um, you know, I... So I had just read one of Kristen Hanna's books, um, The Four Winds, which just came out earlier this, this was it this month? Yeah, I suppose it was, yeah. right at the beginning of February, um, which if we're looking for book recommendations, I also recommend The Four Winds. If you liked The Nightingale, you'll enjoy The Four Winds as well. That's Dusk Bowl era stuff. But, um, and that was actually my first read by Kristen Hanna. So now I've, now I've got two under my belt in the, in the month after that one came out. But um, I really appreciated um, the way she did it in that book, as well as this one. It, it's one of her strengths is the believability of her characters. Um, and I think what, what it is that she does that makes them so believable is that she doesn't think of each character as like a character by themselves. Um, she does a really good job of what I call systems theory, um, which is like a counseling idea. But it's this idea that, you know, a person is not a person by themselves. A person is a person in the system that they exist in. So the way that they, you know, um, the way that they you know, interact with their family members and their friends and the people around them has to be really believable in a story as well. And if their interactions aren't, aren't believable, then they aren't a believable character. So I think she does a really, really good job of showing us you know, sisters who are in conflict uh, because of the things that are going on with their father and the way that they interact with you know, nieces and nephews and with children and um, with their friends. And I think the relationships around them being believable are what makes so many of her characters so believable. The relationships were good, and I think that the book was plausible. You know, I think the author did a good job probably researching the book, and the personalities were great. And, and the first thing that comes to my mind when when I ask this question, where the character is believable, is the character who was formerly known as Ari, but it, it was currently known as Daniel, the little boy that she took in. He seemed like just a real person to me. I think he was the most vivid and, and believable personality in the whole book. And, and maybe I can't put my finger on why that is exactly, but it seemed like she really got it right from like a very young perspective, what things would have been like. You know, I thought it was almost heartbreaking when Vianne was was trying to teach him that his name was Daniel now, and he kind of caught on to it, and he he started playing along with the game, you know, and it was just such a serious thing. It was, it was a life or death thing, whether you could fake your identity a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that that all of the personalities were believable. You know, I really liked the personality of Beck, and we'll come to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and I liked the the kind of clashing personalities with uh, the Anne and Isabel. And we're going to come to that as well. But uh, yeah, I think that the characters seemed believable. You know, I'm very strict on plausibility. The slightest thing can can kind of kill it for me if it just doesn't seem like it's plausible. But I didn't have any problems with that. So yeah, I think that the characters were, were quite believable in this novel. And I just can't say enough about how much I liked the character Daniel. Although he was a minor player in the novel, I guess it really just drove home what was happening for me when it came to his part of the story. But and that's and that's how you yeah. can tell whether whether you know a novel is really an excellent novel or just a good novel is you know main characters a lot of times get fleshed out. But when a when a side when your side characters also have a lot of life and are also very vivid, um, that's when you can tell a really excellent novels come around. So yeah, I appreciated that as well. 
That was true. And, and a very dramatic scene with Daniel is when <clears throat> finally it's, it seems like in this book, every time something finally seemed like maybe it was going to turn out, then it, then it was just hacked off in progress. But Daniel becomes a part of the family and he's, he actually thinks he is a part of the family. It's been so long now that he can't remember his real mother and <clears throat> They come to get him. They come to take him away. And I thought that that was just such uh, a dramatic thing. And, and although this novel was fiction, just about everything that happened in that book was experienced by at least someone somewhere at some point in time during the war, whether in France or, or Denmark or or anywhere else. But uh, yeah, I just can't say enough about how she authored the character Daniel. It just really struck me, I guess. Let's move on to the next one here. Yeah. What did you already know about this book subject before you read it? And I'll take this one. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I it seems like the more I learn about something, the more I become aware of how much there is that I don't know about that particular thing. And I guess I, outside of Number of the Stars and what happened in Denmark, I guess this book just, well, let, let, me, uh, let me start over here. I've read books on the Holocaust, maybe a few general history books, right, about the war and Adolf Hitler and everything. Uh, and I've read quite a few concentration camp survivor memoirs. You know, I've learned, I've read a lot about Auschwitz and, and places like that. But I guess what I'm getting at here is that there's a lot that I don't know about the war. And this book makes me want to read more. You know, I want to read a book on the First World War so that I can understand why the Second World War happened. Um, but I guess... What I'm getting at is my knowledge is fairly limited in this area. So how about you? What did you already know about the subjects in this book uh, before we read it? Yeah, yeah. Similar to you, I would not consider myself like a World War II buff. Like, I don't know. Um, you know, there are a lot of things in this book that I had to look up and, see and find out more about and and learn more about because I was like, oh, is that real? Is it not real? And, and similar to you, I found that a lot of the things that happen in this book have basis in reality. She, she you know, obviously researched this quite a bit. Um, and it, similar to you also, I, I've been inspired to, to read some more things as well. Um, actually, you know, this is a little bit more controversial, but I, I recently put Mein Kampf on my list of things I want to read, um, not because I want to emulate Hitler in any way, shape or form, but just because I'm so interested in, in how do you get to this place where you believe that the concentration camps and all of the things, the atrocities that were happening was the right thing. Um, and, I, and I'm interested just to see how, how did you get so twisted that you that you believe those beliefs? Um, so you know, very interested in, in learning more about um, the time period and, and just kind of understanding, yeah, more. Me too. Um, no, I really want to read one on World War One because that's, I feel like that's the biggest hole in my understanding. Uh, but this is a book, uh, and this is, is playing off of what you just said, Ordinary Men. This one is called Ordinary Men, Reserve Police Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland. And what this one is about during the war, the Nazis were out killing people with the SS and whatnot. And in Germany, there was a reserve police battalion, Battalion 101, and some other battalions that were like middle-aged men. They weren't involved in the war. They weren't allied as particularly being in the Nazi party, so to speak. And the Nazis ran out of killers. They ran out of people to go and go out and kill people. So they recruited Reserve Police Battalion 101 to go out and commit these horrific crimes. And these guys did not want any part of it, but they were forced into it by the, the German regime. And this is another really good piece of history concerning the psychology of, of the war. That What this is about is the ordinary man. What would an ordinary man go through if they were forced into uh, becoming part of the German killing machine? But I just wanted to mention that uh, as far as like a historical reference, I think that that's a great book concerning the mindset of everyone involved in the war. Yeah. But let's move on to this next one. I think that this is an interesting question, and, and I'll let you take this one here. Those sisters, Isabel and Vianne, react to conflict and war in very different ways. Do you identify more with Isabel's impetuous yet brave approach or Vianne's quiet strength? Hmm. Yeah, I think... Um... I think, you know, if you asked me this question 10 years ago, it easily been, would have been an Isabel situation. Um, just because, you know, there's something about youth that goes along with that impetuousness, doesn't it? But now that I have a family yeah. and a wife and kids, it, I feel like I, I have valued more and more the, the strong, quiet, 
bravery that comes with um, living a hard life and not feeling like you can do anything about it. Um, and so, so, you know, as much as Isabel's story is amazing and she's so brave and so incredible, I definitely feel like for me personally, I relate more with Vienne and, and, um, and, and I feel like if I was in a similar situation, I think I would respond more like Vienne um, in that, you know, similarly brave. I, I don't, I think she was also so brave in some of the things that she did. Um, just such an incredible story from both of them. Yeah, and, and largely it comes from maturity, right? Because Vianne was in a position where she had people that depended on her and children that were in a horrible situation that relied on her to stay alive, basically. So she was very cautious. And I think that that's the approach that I would have probably taken to try to be extremely quiet and not draw attention and planning every possible thing out, and be prepared for everything that could have happened. Um, you know, anytime an author writes a book that gets an emotional response out of the reader, it's an ace in my book. And I know that I was actually becoming frustrated with Isabel at points in this book because she was doing something that could potentially put everyone in danger and get everyone killed because the stakes were so high. And of course, she brought the airman uh, and, and hid him down in the cellar. That was the yeah. scene where Beck was killed. And I thought it was interesting in that scene where the author put the death of Beck on both of the sisters' hands. They were actually at a dispute over who killed him. Um, but yeah, um, I think that I identify more with Vianne. And uh, although Vianne was a, was a heroine in the war, Isabel was probably the bigger heroine. So, you know, I, I guess I can appreciate both takes and I can understand Isabel's take to some degree, at least, where she just wasn't happening or she just wasn't having it. And that reminds me of the little sister, Kirsty, in this book, where she just wasn't going to have any shit from anyone. And she was the younger sister in this book. So um, in conclusion to that, I think that I would have probably tried to play my cards like the Anne played them. Uh, and both sisters were heroes and they both took different routes about it. But I thought that that was very interesting, the, the contrast there between how the sisters handled the situation. And I was really surprised at how far Isabel got with um, saving people and whatnot. That was one of the things that I looked up to see if it was real or not. And I found out it was a real woman that inspired the book. Um, but let's yeah. go on. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to say also, you know, that that is the strength of her writing as well. That that's the sisters were so, you know, times opposed to where they were, you know, to each other. And and like you said, you know, you were getting very frustrated with Isabel. I could easily see um someone reading the same story and getting frustrated at the end. And, and that's both characters are so believable and so real um, that you can really see these two sisters that are so diametrically opposed to each other, but both have such good hearts and, and really we're looking for the same things um, in a lot of ways. That is true. What did you think of the relationship between uh, Papa and his daughters? That was heartbreaking. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was really hard. Um, like you mentioned about wanting to learn more about World War One. That was the thing about Papa was, um, you know, how does how does war affect us? And it it really does. You know, that's such a true part about war is is you, is, you know still to this day people go to war and they come back a different person, um, and that is really really hard. Uh, and, you know, not just someone who's different, but some like a completely different person. And and obviously the war, the Great War, World War One, affected Papa so much that he wasn't able to really to love his daughters in the same way anymore, or, you know, his wife, he came back so different. And so his relationship, while there's a great redemption arc in the story, um, it was just heartbreaking to, um, to see the way that World War I rippled into all the way as, as late as World War II and beyond, because it affects all of their relationships in the future as well, like with, um, with Vienne and all of her kids and all those types of things as well and the way that she reacts to her husband and I don't know. So it's, it's really heartbreaking for me to see, to see their relationship, even though there is a nice redemption in the story. It's not, they never got those years back, you know? The first world war was quite a bloody conflict and a lot of people, a lot of families watched someone leave and, and many families didn't have someone to come back. But on the return of many of the men that went over there, they were different people, completely changed, very, troubled and disturbed and and they separated themselves um, 
from their loved ones oftentimes for whatever psychological reasons, um, post-traumatic stress and, and so on. But, you know, the, the relationship with Papa was very troubling. I just couldn't figure out throughout the novel if he really loved his daughter, daughters or not. I was questioning that. And then I, and then I, I was able to see that he did at the end with the redemption arc and we'll come to that. But, um, you know, I just wasn't sure if I was a fan of Papa's, you know, I really liked the fact that he owned a bookstore. You know, I like it when authors work books into the book. And I really like uh, the Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson because books are primary within that story. But Papa was someone who owned a bookstore and he wrote poetry and books that he knew he wasn't going to sell many of. And I just like the fact that he was a literary lover. I connected with him in that way. However, I just wish, I guess, that he would have been more loving to his daughters because he sent them away on multiple occasions. It was like he was willing to take just enough responsibility to juggle them for a little while and pass them off to someone else. Yeah. And, you know, perhaps there was good reason for that because of what he experienced in the war. But I guess I'm just polarized on Papa. Uh, and I give him a lot of credit for what happens in the end of the novel. But um, I don't know. Perhaps I still haven't made my mind up about what I think of his character. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, there's a sense that, you know, you want to give him the, ex the the benefit of the doubt because he did deal with so many atrocities in World War I. But also, you know, just because we go through things doesn't mean we get to, <clears throat> to pass them on to other people. So That is true. And he was a great character. You know, anytime an author can write a character where the reader is just internally conflicted, uh, I think that that's an A. So I give her a lot of credit for 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 balancing his character in the way that she did. Yeah. The next one, I'll, I'll take this one. As she lives and learns more about Captain Beck, the Anne is torn between many emotions, including sympathy. Did you also find yourself feeling more sympathetic toward Beck as the novel progressed? You know, when Beck first comes into the family's lives, he comes in in a much different manner than the SS officer comes in later on. And he seems to try to establish dominance over them in the very beginning by uh, the thing with Isabel's hair, where her hair is cut. Uh, and then it seemed like once he had made his point, he was more gentle. And he seemed to come to actually appreciate and actually maybe even really care about uh, the Anne and the family there over time because he puts himself at risk uh, at some point where he's he actually helps her to get uh, information about her husband and whatnot, which he could have been killed for. And he also uh, starts giving her information. For example, he tells her that her neighbor should not be home on a particular day. So he really, it almost seemed like he was going to become the new husband at some point where they were like attracted to one another and it didn't go that far, but it was just kind of crazy how all that happened. But I will say that I became a bit sympathetic for Beck because he talks about worrying about his wife and kids. And it wasn't possible for me to become as sympathetic toward him as I was Vianne and her family. But I did take a moment to look at things from his eyes. So uh, I actually kind of liked Beck. I kind of liked Beck. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think so much we imagine the atrocities happening from Germans to others. And that's true, obviously, that, that was a lot of what was happening in World War II was with the concentration camps and with um, all of those different situations. But we, we forget that, you know, they had wives and families back home as well. And so many of the people in Germany had no desire to leave their wives and families and go participate in this war. Um, it easily could have turned, you know, differently pretty quickly um, if, if they had, you know, lots of German families lost their husbands and, and the families that came back from, from those wars also came back different. Um, you know, I actually read, do you know who Eric Carl is? He's uh, the children's book author. He read, he wrote um, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Um, I think he also wrote the Sparkly Fish one. I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, he, he was actually um, in Germany uh, as a child during World War II, and his father was uh, was conscripted to to go to Russia. I just recently heard this story. And his father was kind of put in the Russian version of concentration camps at the end of World War II. And he the gulag. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And he came back like um, 80 pounds and, and basically dying kind of a situation. Like it's, it's super affected the way that Eric Carl um, lived his life. And, and I think, you know, there's so much of World War II stuff that's written from the perspective of 
of you know France or or you know Denmark or wherever um, that we forget that actually the German people were people as well, um, even even ones that committed great atrocities. So I actually appreciated the way that she wrote Beck in a way that yeah he's he's doing evil things definitely, um, but also there's there's morality and ethics involved in that as well. And, and like you said, he had a wife and kid back home, so feel feel for them for sure. You know, I see a kind of dichotomy here with the way that she wrote the Anne and Isabel. There was some clashing, conflicting uh, personality differences there. And she also tried to do the same thing to show both sides of the German war machine with Beck and von Richter. So um, I think that that worked out very well. And Beck was probably one of the better parts of the book. It was interesting to see how he came in and how he evolved over time. And he was even being victimized by the SS. They were blaming him for not finding that airman. And he was worried they were going to kill his ass. So uh, perhaps he was uh, a victim of the German uh, war machine in its own right. But let's move on to the next one here. And you can have this one. What was your reaction to finally discovering the identity of the story's narrator? Was it in line with your expectations or were you taken surprise? Yeah, I, I didn't know exactly how we were going to get there, but about it, probably the third time, second or third time that we got back to the kind of modern day 1990, I think it's 1995, right? Um, yeah. It, I, I kind of expected that it was VN. Um, so when we found out for sure it was VN, you know, I was very, it, you know, that was in line with what I was expecting. Um, I guess we can, we can talk more about the ending a little bit more later, but I think I was expecting it. It, it didn't surprise me a lot when we kind of found out um, for sure who she was. Yeah, you know, I was actually trying to calculate the ages because it taught in the beginning of the book, it uh, gives like the, the years 41, 42 and whatnot. And I realized that Sophie would be just a little bit too young. She would be about 55. So it would be unlikely that she would be in a nursing home. So I figured it had to be either Isabel or Vianne. And I thought that it worked out very well with Vianne. And this will actually lead us into the next question here. Uh, and I'll go on here, but do you think that Julian had a right to know who his father was? Would you have made the same decision Vianne did? And I liked how it comes down to where Vianne is uh, identified as the narrator for us. And she has her son, and the son is von Richter's son, because Vianne was raped um, when the SS guy was, was staying with her. And I thought that that was a, a, a pretty dramatic part of the story. And this is one of the better questions because I guess I'm just a fan of truth in these troubling situations where I think that perhaps, of course, I wasn't. It, it's really hard and sometimes inappropriate to suggest what you would have done had you been in someone else's position. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess my my intuition is that perhaps truth would have come out at some point in time concerning his identity, because I guess if I were in that position, and someone told me there was a big secret about my life. Do I want to know about it or not? I would probably say that I did want to know about it, but um, I can certainly see why she would have kept his identity a secret. And perhaps that was for the best. But what do you think about that? Yeah, I tend to agree with you, I think. Um, obviously, you know, it's the same thing. I want to do this with, with as much grace as possible because I don't want to say, oh, yeah, if I was in the war and I did these things because there's so much trauma that they went through in the survival and all those different pieces. And to say that, you know, I know for sure what I would do is is a little bit, um, you know, prideful of me. But I, I do tend to agree with you that I think, you know, honesty in these situations is really the best way to go. Um, and I think part of the reason why is because so often they end up finding out somehow anyway and, and you go, man, I, you know, if they're going to find out, I'd much rather than find out from me in a safe situation where I say, you know, I love you. It has nothing to do with, you know, all these different things um, as opposed to finding out later because they find some document or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, and so maybe, you know, maybe there's no situation where he could have found out. But personally, I think that honesty tends to be the better place to be with these. And um, that's probably what I would have done. But, you know, who knows what I actually would have done. You know, as... Um when they're in the uh, the room there and Vian is giving the speech and everything, uh, Daniel actually approaches her and he talks about the fact that his family tried to make him forget them. They told him, forget about those people, but he never did. And he finally seeked her out years later. And I thought that that was very fitting because I think that Daniel, in some respects, was my favorite character in the book. Mm -hmm. I think that that he really highlighted how 
high the stakes were because someone like him could have just been crushed and and killed you know when uh but what i'm getting at here is that i thought that that was a fitting ending to the story i like the fact that he worked his way back into it for just a moment there at the end and i'm just concerned or i'm just uh curious about what you thought about the fact that he he was at the speech that vian gave yeah yeah well i'll start by saying uh the part of the book that made me cry was when they came to get daniel <laughs> and take him away um i i had a a very emotional response there, um, yeah, and like I said, as a as a father, you know, that that affects me. I don't know in such a heavy way where it's like, man, that was for all intents and purposes, Daniel was her child. You know, that's not like, yeah, um, it's not like, oh, well, she wasn't really like, no, she really loved him. He was really part of the family, and and so that that was very, um, you know, I, I can only imagine how traumatic that would have been for her and for him, and so it was very touching. It was very. Um, you know, I really appreciated the reunion at the end. I just thought it was really spectacular. And I, I love the fact that, you know, he, he even affirms and says, you know, I, I never forgot you. I couldn't forget you. So. Mm. Yeah. And he even says that he slept with the, uh, the little stuffed animal because Sophie runs back in when they're taking him away. She runs back in to get her, her prized stuffed animal that uh, was like one of her emotional crutches through everything that she was going through. And she gave it to him. And he yeah. said that he slept with it for years. Let's go just a little bit farther into his character. Um, so they come for Daniel at some point. Uh, this organization comes for him and they say, look, this kid's got a uh, biological family somewhere and we're going to work on getting him back to uh, where he should properly be. And I'm curious what you think about this because I was considering this and I thought my my initial reaction was that he should have stayed where he was at because he was in a pretty good situation as far as the people that cared about him there. Uh, and he wanted to be where he was at, obviously. Of course, being a child, he didn't have the best understanding of the scenario. But yeah. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, what would the mother have wanted, Rachel? Because Oftentimes, when someone's part of a religious organization, that's of very high importance. And perhaps Rachel would have wanted him to go to be with uh, his relatives and be raised up in a way that perhaps she would have uh, raised him. So I guess yeah. I'm just not really sure what should have happened there, but I'm curious what you think about it. Yeah, that's a hard question because really you're asking the question, you know, which one is more important between cultural heritage that, you know, he's a Jew or or what is better for Ari or Daniel as as a person and i feel like those answers are actually opposed to each other as a as an individual and as a person all the psychology in our current day psychology would say it's best for him to be in the home where he's he's attached you know he has a mom he has he has a family and he's familiar with those surroundings you know for his personal growth and and you know development staying where he was at was best for him but then it becomes a question of the cultural you know like they point, pointed out in the book millions of jews had just been killed um we need to we need to survive at some level as a jewish community we, we need to be able to continue on or else our culture will be wiped out altogether um so i similar to you i, I don't know what the right answer is um yeah i don't know what the right answer is that's a really really hard question and a lot of people would have had to have dealt with that kind of question at the time. You know, it was it was all just a very troubling, troubling issue. Let's move on to the next one here. We've got a few more to go. I'll take this one. Do you have a new perspective as a result of reading this book? And I do, you know, I'm someone who hasn't read a ton of historical fiction in my life. Like I said, Number of the Stars was probably the last one that I read and very similar theme in those. Um, and I think that it, it can be really interesting that you can learn something from reading a piece of historical fiction, because one of the primary intentions on a piece of historical fiction is to actually show you how history really unfolded without getting anything wrong. Um, and I think that the author probably did a pretty good job of that in this book. And it makes me want to read more historical fiction. Uh, I actually set a goal at the beginning of the year. I had a few different goals, one to read 60 books, one to read 10 new authors, and one to read some historical fiction. And I'm on the road uh, to completing that book now, having finished The Nightingale. But it makes me wonder now, as far as the change perspective goes, how many other scenarios unfolded during the war that I am ignorant about? And it makes me want to read perhaps another historical fiction book of something that maybe is related in some way. So what do you think? How has your perspective changed uh, after reading this book? 
Yeah, I think um, I pointed out at the beginning that I think part of what she was trying to achieve was subverting our expectations. And I think one thing that I specifically have been thinking a lot about and pondering about is like we were talking about with Beck, where you think about, you know, actually everyone who's involved in the war was a human at some level, uh, not at some level, they were all humans. And the question of, you know, how, how do you, where's the humanity in each person that was, that was participating? Um, I mentioned also that, you know, I want to go read Mein Kampf because I, you know, sometimes it's so easy to dehumanize the German armies and, um, and the Nazis and even Hitler himself, you know, that's, that's one of the greatest insults in our culture right now is to say, you're like Hitler. Um, yeah. And, and so, and, and I agree, right. We're in Western society. We definitely say, you know, don't want to be like Hitler that, that I totally agree with that, but there's a sense of actually, you know, how do we, how do we find the humanity in, in great atrocities still? And I think that, you know, that was um, something that, that changed, that changed for me a little bit in this novel. You know, when it comes to Hitler, I think there were actually maybe some tyrants that killed more people than he did, so to speak. But it seemed like history, Hitler's system of going about exterminating people was probably the most ruthless and evil, if you will, that we've ever seen. And I actually want to read this book here. It's called Adolf Hitler by John Toland. It's like around 1,300 pages. And I think the psychology of someone like Hitler is very interesting and I would like to actually know more about what what happened to turn him into what he was you know I'm curious about how something like that happened so I'd really like to read this biography and I will but uh, I guess the reason I'm mentioning it is because <clears throat> I want to learn more about the war you know this book changed my perspective. You know, it kind of makes it so that I realize that there's a whole lot going on that is of great interest concerning history that I'm not aware about. And I heard a lot about Adolf Hitler, but I've never actually read anything about his mind. And I want to do that. I think that this book is going to be a good book, not only on the subject involved, but the war in general. It almost certainly will be. Um, so yeah, this is another one that I want to read to try to learn more about the war and uh, the human condition. Let's go on to the next one here. You can have this one. What did you think of the ending? Yeah. Um, I'll say this, this is, um, and this might be controversial among reviewers in general about Nightingale. I really struggled with um, putting together the pieces at the end between 1995 and 1945, whenever we leave off. I feel like, um, the idea with Julian that somehow he grew up with, you know, a mom and a father who were just fresh off of World War II. They somehow get to the United States, which I'm not sure we ever find out how, you know, hopefully early, yeah. apparently early enough that he doesn't remember it. So in the next couple of years, they leave their ancestral home that they just spent the last six years defending, unwilling to leave. Suddenly there something happens to say that they're suddenly leaving. And then Julian never finds about any of it, even though he has an older sister and two parents who lived through the war. And he's supposed to be a very analytical, logical doctor, but for whatever yeah. reason, he doesn't ever put any of those pieces together. He doesn't think about what year he was born or the fact that his parents have German or French ancestry and speak French. And somehow he just doesn't, he doesn't put any of those pieces together that he was even some way, you know, involved with World War II. And all of that was the one piece that felt unbelievable to me. So as much as she did put a lot of puzzle pieces together when she came to the end of the book, I felt like there was something missing for me in the plausibility of the ending, if that kind of makes sense. And I was I was hoping for more from how we got to 1945 to 1995, where where those things had happened, if that kind of makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I, I can see what you're talking about concerning the plausibility of Julian's character. It did seem like he was totally aloof about everything. And she makes, she really makes the point that he's an analytical scientist type guy, right? So I can see that. What did you think as far as uh, the ending with Isabel and Papa um, putting himself on the line to save her? And, and right at that point, they're arguing over who the Nightingale is. They want to take the bullet for one another, literally. What did you think about how that played out? I absolutely loved, um, obviously we kind of talked just a little bit about Papa's redemption arc, but I love the fact that he takes the time to not only visit Isabel and, and let her know that he loves her, but also Vienna ahead of time and said, you know, hey, I yeah. actually do love you daughters. I do love 
Um, and, and, and then really in a very visceral and you know, performance based way, he shows that he loves them by being willing to take the bullet um, and, and, and take over the position of Nightingale, basically, which he knew was a death sentence. Um, he took the time to write the note. Like, I just love that whole redemption arc. I think that was so beautiful. Yeah, you know, I, I finally come to the decision that I liked his character. And it is important that he didn't just rush into it. He had considered it, and he took the time to quickly go to the end and say, uh, you know, this is how I feel about everything. And I thought that that was great. He really did redeem himself there. And then he paid the ultimate penalty, which was death. And perhaps after everything he had been through, um, perhaps he wanted it to end. I don't know. But I thought that that was great, that it was a really dramatic part of the book uh, that really worked out well. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And when it comes to the ending in general, uh, I thought that it was kind of maybe rushed a little bit. Now that you mentioned what you did, I'm thinking it through. I thought that it it did kind of pull it together, but maybe the part with Julian was a little off. Maybe it was a little off. Uh, I like the fact that she, you know, uh, the end didn't tell him and everything. I, I thought it played out pretty well, but, but in conclusion, I'll agree with you that maybe there could have been just a little bit more to clarify exactly what happened with VN after the war and everything. Yeah, there's a sense, if I were to pick a weakest character in the novel, um, Julian would be the one that, that I would say is the weakest uh, character in my opinion. Who would you say was the strongest character? Hmm. Good question. Um, I think, I think VN was probably my, the character I resonated with the most. Um, you know, I, I really felt like like her decision making when she was thinking about parenting, but then also what do you do when you have an infant thrust into your arms? Like, I just feel like so much of what she did uh, felt real to me. Yeah. Yeah. I like Isabel's character, even though I was frustrated with some of the things that she did. One of the, the main things that I took away from this and that I'll try to, to utilize in my own life, right, because I like to learn something that I can take away from the book, extract it from the book and apply it. Um, Isabel experienced perseverance. She was in a position that seemed like it may have been impossible to make any kind of progress. And she somehow managed to not only make progress, but become a great heroine. She made a big difference on everything that she did with getting people out. And she saved a lot of lives and everything. And she was in a position where she could have just basically either died or suffered out accomplishing nothing or make huge accomplishments, right? And she did that. And for that reason, I think that she was my favorite character. And I'd really like to read maybe a real biography on the lady that uh, uh, inspired the character that was Isabel, the real Nightingale. Um, but I just really liked how she overcame because I'm all into overcoming. Uh, and I thought that she had like a maximum overcoming with the position that she was in. You know, it actually reminds me of a nonfiction book that I have here. Uh, it's a, it's called, um, it's about a, a man that was, let me get it. Yeah, well, while you're doing that, um, one thing I really liked about Isabel's character is the way that um, Kristen Hanna ties it together with love. I think there's also a theme throughout the Nightingale where um, this thought that maybe like love can't really be stopped even by all the atrocities <clears throat> and the horrible things that are happening. And we see that with Papa, obviously, in his redemption arc, but then we also see that with um, Isabel and Gate uh, and the way that they interact um, and, and how they love each other, even despite all of the horrible things that happened. and. Um, all their own fears and insecurities and the war itself and everything else. So, yeah, I just really felt like she did a good job with love and war and the way those things intersect. Yeah, Gaetan was a good character. You know, he was another one that had just all kinds of problems going on. And maybe perhaps he was similar to Papa in the way that he was unwilling to commit, you know, to, uh, to Isabel and everything. And I thought that he worked out well, but uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. This is a philosophical, psychological book, and it's one half concentration camp survivor's memoir, one half psychological study on goal setting and achieving. You know, the author in here talks about setting goals 
and having vision, even in the worst case scenarios, like Isabel, um, he was in Auschwitz and he was still like setting goals and trying to go forward and, and accomplish things. And it was like an extremely dramatic, inspiring tale was Man's Search for a Meaning. I highly recommend this one. Um, but it just makes me think of Isabel and how she was in uh, a bad situation with a lot of oppression that seemed maybe impossible to penetrate, but she made a huge difference, an epic difference. And I just really liked that fact. So as far as uh, my favorite character, well, I really like the character Daniel, but I can't say enough about how much I liked Isabel and, and what she managed to do because of the, the conditions that were set upon her. Yeah. So let's, let's go with the final question here and then we'll, we'll, we'll summarize what we think about this book and we'll, we'll call it a day. You Great. can take this one. Okay. Would you read another book by this author? Why or why not? <laughs> yeah. Well, I already uh, told you guys earlier, literally at the beginning of this month, I read um, the four winds and already a month later, I've picked up another book by her and that's just how, how much I appreciate her writing. I think she's very thorough in her research. I think she's really, um, and she writes such good characters. Like I mentioned, there's something about the way that they interact with each other that makes them really, really believable. Um, and actually, I also, something else that she does, I'm not sure if this is all of her books or not, but I, I'm kind of assuming, um, at least it's a common element, is, is telling the female side of the story. Because so often we hear about, you know, uh, the, the male side of various historical events because the war is kind of the, the thing that's in the forefront. But there's so much happening in in the background that is just as important, um, just as vital as, as the, the, you know, the kind of frontline war stories. So um, I would definitely plan on picking up another book by her. Firefly is Fireflies. I think that's that one, that's one yeah. that she's written somewhat recently. That's one that I'm thinking about picking up next because I've seen some really positive reviews for it. So I think there might even be like a television series that's based on that one or something. But yeah. well, let me ask you this. Which book that you read by Kristen Hanna did you think was the better read overall? You know, I actually liked this one better. Um, uh, I, I like this one better. You know, I, this one this one was sad, but had a lot better redemption arcs in it, I think, and it felt like a, a more satisfying conclusion. Um, the other one, which is based on Dust Bowl, it's, it's very similar. I felt like it was actually very similar to Grapes of Wrath, um, maybe written a little better than that, which is a Steinbeck uh, book. Yeah. Basically the same same idea in history. Um, and, and, and that is not a knock at all on the four winds, but I think this one was just you know marginally a little bit better and I think I preferred it more. I would definitely read another book by her. She has another one called The Great Alone. You know, I'm someone that likes to browse Goodreads and look for books that have like abnormally high ratings on them. And The Nightingale actually has like a 4.57 rating, which is an unusually high rating yeah. uh, for a book. Yeah, yeah with, with um, so many reviews. I think it has, I, I looked to see, and it was like, wow, how does that have 4.6 stars out of, you know, with this many reviews on it? It was kind of crazy. Right. Yeah, because something, for, for it to really stand tall, it's got to have like at least like, I don't know, 10,000 ratings or something. Oftentimes you'll see a book that has this real high rating, but only 10 people have read it, right? Um, but The Great Alone is another one that has a significant amount of ratings and reviews, and it's like a 4.3, something like that. So, uh, I'm interested in that one, but I thought that she did really well. She did really well. Uh, and, you know, she seems to be someone who has a good understanding of how societies work and motive works and relationships work. And I'd like to see her author up another tale. I'm thinking about going with the great alone just because um, of the high rating on Goodreads, the recommendations. But I like a good dramatic tale. You know, this one reminds me of where the crawdads sing. Have you, have you read that one? I did. Yeah. I read it last year about this time. So yeah, it was, a, it was a great book. I thought that one was just a damn good book. Yeah, uh, that was, was one of the best great. damn books I ever read. It was written so well. And then there were times, um, there were times when it was like, man, I want to put the book down because it's so hard. Like there's so much going on, <laughs> but it's like, but I don't want to stop, you know, like <laughs> just that, that tussle between wanting to put it down and wanting to keep reading. You know, I think I'm going to do a video here soon on the three books that I've read in the last few years that were like the most dramatic, touching kind of tales. Mm -hmm. And The Nightingale will be on that list and Where the Crawdads Sing will be on that list. And the other one will probably be This Tender Land. 
by William Kent Kruger. Uh, so if you liked The Nightingale and you liked Where the Crawdad Sang, you might want to check out This Tender Land by William Kent Kruger. Have you heard of him? I'll bet you haven't. I've heard of him, but I haven't, um, I haven't read yeah. that one. So, yeah. Yeah, I actually interviewed William Kent Kruger, uh, I don't know, some months ago. And he writes this series of books called the Iron Lake Mystery Series. There's like 20 of them in it. But he also has two novels that are like dramas. One called This Tender Land, which I thought was an extraordinarily good book. Uh, and another one called Ordinary Grace, which was a very similar kind of dramatic thing. But uh, yeah, I recommend those three books. The Nightingale, Where the Crawdads Sing, and This Tender Land. And another one I could even put on that list, if you like YA, would be The Fault in Our Stars by John Green, which I thought was a great book. Have you read that one? I did read that one. That is <laughs> That was a really good one. Let's get on with the final, uh, or actually it's now time to summarize our thoughts. Well, I appreciate you coming on and talking with me. I, I've enjoyed the conversation. Um, and what we'll do now is we'll just summarize our thoughts. I'll go first and then, and then you can go and And when you're done, we'll cut it right there. You'll get the final word. So I think that this was, a great book. It was a, I was expecting a good book because of the recommendations. That's why I chose to read it or to read it. That's why I organized a group to read the thing because of the recommendations and the high Goodreads rating. So I was expecting a good book. However, I'll say that it probably trumped my expectations. Uh, it wasn't the best damn book I ever read, but I thought it was a particularly good book. It was a book that got an emotional reaction out of me. I didn't cry, but I was thinking about it at, at one point. I was thinking about it. Um, and I thought that the characters were great. There's very little that I could criticize on this book. Uh, the only thing that comes up would maybe be the fast ending with um, with Julian and the, 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 the kind of brief, brief explanation we get at the end. However, that is negligent as far as I'm concerned. And I thought it was a great book. It was an emotional uh, journey. It was. I thought it was. The length was good. I thought the pacing was was good. I gave it a five star rating on Goodreads. I'd probably give it. I'd probably give it a nine out of ten. Uh, and that's all I've got to say. I highly recommend it. What did you think? Yeah, yeah, I agree with a lot of what you said. I think um, this beat my expectations as well. And like you said, I, I was expecting a good book um, because I just read another one of hers. This one was a little bit better than the one I just read by her. And I really liked that, that other one, The Four Winds. So um, yeah, overall, really, really good book. Like you mentioned, the ending was a little bit uh, of a disappointment for me just because I was expecting more loose ends to be tied up. I was hoping for just a little bit more information um, about how Julian tied into that picture and how he got to where he was. So as a character, I feel like he was missing a little bit of something. Um, but overall, like I said, pacing really, really good. Um, very little time where I, I, I kind of flew through the book in just a couple of days, um, just because you know I was kind of I was just really enjoying it. So it's an enjoyable read. It's educational about World War II, inspiring, makes you want to read more, um, but also. Um, not one of those educational books that is like a slog to try and get through. Like it was enjoyable. We really, I really enjoyed the read and would recommend this book easily for anyone who's interested in historical fiction. It's a no brainer to recommend this book.